I think you are all here to meet our guest from University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, his name is Math uh, Dr. Matthew Hora, and uh, he is, uh, comes to us actually from the, as an assistant professor in adult teaching and learning in the Department of Liberal Arts and uh, Applied Sciences Studies at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, he's a research scientist at the Wisconsin Center for Education Research, and his uh, background uh, actually follows an interesting path. Uh, he, uh, has a P he holds a PhD in learning sciences uh, from the Department of Educational Psychology at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, also has a, a, a background in uh, a master's degree in anthropology, which is, uh, uh, I think you'll see, comes out in his research and how he goes about uh, thinking about questions and problems in education. Uh, and, and also has a, a degree, uh, his undergraduate degree in English. Uh, so um, synthesizing all these skills coming together around uh, asking questions about how, uh, what's the relationship between uh, uh, the career path that people follow through K-12 higher education primarily and into career and college, or career and uh, readiness for career and the skills required uh, in something that he's been examining uh, in his recent studies around something called the skills gap. So I think this will be a really interesting conversation, a very timely conversation for us as we think about our own curriculum here at the University of Oregon and the connections we're making across K-12, higher ed, and into industry and job readiness. Uh, I, I hope you will join me in welcoming our guest, Dr. Matthew Hora. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. I really appreciate the time you've taken out of your busy schedule to hear about um, this research that we concluded about a year and a half ago. It's a three-year study in the state of Wisconsin about the skills gap. And before I start, um, I've posted the slides on slideshare.net, which is a LinkedIn-related website. So if you'd like to look at any of the slides, they're all up there. And if any of you have any questions or complaints or comments while I'm talking about the data from our study and our implications, please feel free to interrupt and ask a question. So um, this is a book we had come out last fall, my two um, colleagues, Ross and Amanda. We all fanned out throughout the state of Wisconsin and talked to people about the skills gap. And I'm gonna present the data um, from this study and what we think this means for preparing college students for life and work. Just a small little question there that we're addressing. <laughs> now, the skills gap has been an idea that's been around since at least World War II, but after the Great Recession of 2008, um, it took on a, a life of its own. You can see here the CNBC reference to millions of jobs in the United States just can't be filled because of a skills shortage. And so this idea that the skills gap is like this monster devouring the US economy has become really widespread in the media and amongst politicians in our country. Not the least of which is the governor of the state that I live in now in Wisconsin, Governor Scott Walker has talked about the skills gap extensively. Um, here he talks about employers that cannot find enough skilled workers to fill positions. And this is a very real concern in Wisconsin and around the country. And the concern that Governor Walker is talking about is without these skilled workers, companies can't grow, they can't take on new orders, and thus the state and the national economy um, remains sluggish. And when people talk about the skills gap, I like to think of it as a narrative or a frame, because it's one way to think about the world that we live in. And in the skills gap narrative, there's one um, cause for the skills gap and that is this bachelor's trained barista. Um, I wish I was exaggerating, but most of the skills gap conversations center on higher education as the sole cause of the skilled worker shortage, largely because the whole system is inadequately prepared, um, preparing students for the workforce, especially in four-year colleges and universities and particularly in the arts and humanities. Here, um, this is a very influential policy research institute in Milwaukee and they single out Renaissance art. You often hear about French literature, art history. Um, my personal favorite is Tarantino Film Studies. It's been singled out as just inadequately aligned to workforce needs. I didn't know that major existed, but I guess it does. 
But the idea is that these are students being prepared in disciplines where there's no um, corresponding occupation or job out in the labor market. That's the frame. This is the story of the skills gap. Part of this, too, is that the College for All movement, which is pushing students into four-year universities, needs, needs to be changed to have more students be going into community and technical colleges. So the dominant frame of the skills gap is this, that we have this talent supply chain that's broken. And the, largely, the cause is a failed educational system. And when it comes to the demand side of the equation, there's no problem. There's plenty of good middle class, middle wage jobs out there. And the problem's on the supply side. And one of the, the main solutions to the skills gap is to build career ladders or career pathways that lead directly from college or university education to a specific occupation. And the, the theory or the idea underlying this whole approach is the human capital account, where investments in education um, will uh, translate into higher wages on the individual level and higher productivity in the, the labor market. And as you can see, part of our study finds um, that the human capital account is an inadequate way to think about these issues. Um, it's part of the puzzle, but it's not the whole thing. One of the main responses, like I said, to the skills gap narrative is career pathways. And this is an example of one. Um, this is for nursing. And so you can see as a student enters um, into a community college, in this case, they're given a really clear pathway about the types of courses that they need to take and the sequence in order to get to a specific credential so that they can acquire a certain job at a certain wage. It's all laid out in a very clear pathway or map. I picked this one, Registered Nurses, because when I looked at the Bureau of Labor Statistics data for the, the, the jobs that are going to be produced the most in the next 10 years, out of the top five, this was the only one that paid above a living wage. So I thought that I would um, highlight this one. But this is an example of the type of structure that people are hoping colleges and universities will start to adapt and adopt so that students have a clear pathway to a job. And this idea is being adopted at the national level. Um, national Skills Coalition is a very influential um, group of businesses and educators thinking about this. The WIOA embeds pathways into its policies. And at the state level, Wisconsin, Oregon, and California are just a few of the states that are really embracing this idea. Now, when we went out in the field and started to collect data, we saw this idea of a career pathway um, evident from the very beginning. Um, up in Superior, which is a small town at the northernmost part of Wisconsin. Um, it's an old manufacturing and mining town that's fallen on hard times. And so when Kestrel, which is a company that builds small jet planes for very rich people, was looking for a manufacturing facility to build, um, the, the government offered them millions of dollars in tax breaks to locate up in Superior. And with the promise of creating 600 middle wage jobs, this would have been a huge boon to that local economy. And so this made statewide and regional headlines um, that this was going to happen. The response by the local educational community was this. And you can see that they explicitly co-opted the idea of the skills gap. <laughs> so this technical college said, OK, here's this new aerospace industry. It's already, they had a small component of it there, but it's growing now. We're going to create a composite technology program, which will train students on how to fix the airplane wing and um, the different fiberglass components of an airplane to prevent the skills gap from happening there. So this was kind of a let's get ahead of the curve type of response by the local technical college. So one of the questions that we ask in our book, and as researchers we were starting to ask too, is, is this narrative, and is also the human capital account, an accurate diagnosis of the challenges facing higher ed in the labor market? You'll see that the answer is no from our perspective, but you can make your own um, conclusions. But the conclusions from a lot of labor economists is no, and some go so far as to call it a myth. Um, this is Mark Levine from UW-Milwaukee, and after analyzing a lot of data about wages of welders and um, trend lines over supply and wage growth or stagnation, found that the issue is about the demand side, that there simply wasn't enough good, well-paying welding jobs in Milwaukee. The next day after this report came out, the response from the State Chamber of Commerce, which is by far the most powerful lobby in the state of Wisconsin, was very um, quick and strong. 
They said, we read the report and waited to get to the part where the professor talked to manufacturers, and unfortunately, he did not. Part of the issue here is methodological, where labor economists don't go out and often talk to the business owners. They're looking at large data sets. Governor Walker and the um, chamber here, that's what they do. They go out and talk to business owners. And so they were hearing different stories. And part of this issue is from, that was affecting us as researchers was there seems to be conflicting accounts. What's going on here? And so I decided to be the professor to go out and talk to the manufacturers. And so we designed this study um, where the three of us, uh, my colleagues and I, fanned out throughout the state of Wisconsin, their superior in the very top right there. And we interviewed um, 70 educators in the technical college system and the UW system, and 75 employers. These were, some of them were CEOs, some were HR directors, and some of the smaller companies, they were one and the same. And we focused on manufacturing, which is kind of a cornerstone of the Wisconsin economy. Um, especially in the Milwaukee area, and biotech, which is an uh, up-and-coming industry in South Central Wisconsin. And these are the four things that we focused on in our study. What are the skills that people value out in um, the labor market? How are they being taught and trained? What's going on with hiring? How are people screening for these skills? And then finally, what are the partnerships or lack thereof between education and industry? We decided to kind of cast a wide net because in a lot of research on this topic, people only look at this. What are the skills that employers want? But it's a far more complex problem that involves a lot of moving parts, and so we wanted to focus on these other issues as well. So the first set of data I want to talk about, this is the main lesson that we drew from it, that skills aren't just skills, and they're certainly not the same as occupations. So what do I mean by that? These are results from what's, a, what's called a free list exercise, where we ask people to name off the top of their head short words or short phrases or single words about the skills that are essential for success in the workplace. You can see the educators, um, data is right here, manufacturers, and biotech. And the salient score represents if a term was um, frequently mentioned across the sample and near the top of people's lists, which indicates some psychological salience. And I'll just run through some of the data here. Um, technical ability, which is what cognitive psych psychologists um, refer to as procedural knowledge, or knowledge about how to do something, not just knowledge about something, um, clearly was held in high esteem across the groups. Work ethic was something that was fascinating as an anthropologist. Um, this is what the manufacturing employers thought was most important, because it implicates so many other forces outside of the college classroom. Um, parents, your religious background, um, socialization processes. But work ethic is something that people talked about extensively. Experience on the job and lifelong learning, I clustered these together because in the follow-up interviews, the biotech employers talked about the fact that the science was changing so quickly um, in the biological sciences, they needed people that can continually learn about the new science coming out and the new processes. And if they had somebody that wasn't that quick study, um, it would hold their company back. And then problem solving, this one too was talked about regularly and especially in the context of people's ability to solve ill-defined problems. So not like you're often hand, um, taught in the classroom where you have to pick the one right solution, but these are problems in the workplace that may not have that one right solution and they needed people that can diagnose the situation and pick the optimal solution. One of the limitations with data like these is that these are relatively generic skills. And so in our current study, where we're building off this Wisconsin work, we're really delving deeply even more into just manufacturing and biotech. But what do these skills mean for specific professions and disciplines? Um, for example, one of the occupations we're studying now is nursing. And the way nursing educators and nurses talk about something like communication is very different than the way they talk about communication in a manufacturing and context. So I just share that because whenever you see lists like this, always you know, pause, take a step back and say, well, that's great and all, but what does that mean for a specific field? Because that's where you're gonna get some really interesting variation. One of the things though that we pull out from our data is that we're not just talking about one skill or one competency, but a whole bunch of them. And the NRC calls them 21st century competencies. Um, their framework, it's not perfect, but we found it to be better than hard and soft skills. 
or labor economists like to say non-cognitive or cognitive skills. This covers a lot of territory and it's also really grounded in the research in cognitive science and psychology. And you can see it covers things like uh, critical thinking, teamwork, work ethic. But one of the things that NRC really emphasizes is this idea of transferability. That the goal is to have students acquire these competencies, but not just so that they could succeed in one course, but so they can transfer these competencies from discipline to discipline, but also the academic setting to the workplace or to their own lives or to keeping a healthy um, democracy alive. So what does this look like in the workplace? Well, this is from a manufacturer in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And what he said was we spend a lot of time here. So having people that are just horses asses, for lack of a better word, we just don't want them here. A, because it's a pain to be around them. And B, it takes away the meaningful discussions and the problem solving, which is basically what we do here. So if you see this picture on the top, we, we also did factory tours and lab tours of all the employers. This is what a modern manufacturing facility looks like. Some of them definitely look like something out of a Charles Dickens novel where it's really dark and dusty, but most of them are like this. And instead of somebody working on an assembly line doing the same thing over and over, you have small interchangeable teams of professionals working on different components of a project. And a lot of these are contract work that switch every three to six months. And so you have people constantly shifting from task to task. And so Communication, teamwork, and problem solving are really tightly integrated in the, in the job. And that's why these employers talked about these skills, that they're, they're kind of an integrated bundle of competencies that they want. One of the other things that um, we often heard about is employers especially talked about skills was their cultural nature. And what do I mean by that? Um, well, here's the words of somebody that was interviewed by the State Chamber of Commerce. Um, you know what we, this is the manufacturer speaking, measure when we're trying to hire somebody is YOTF. And the chamber representative said, what is YOTF? And the guy said, years off the farm. So they're looking for a low YOTF quotient, where the further a person is from their rural upbringing, assuming everybody in Wisconsin grows up on a dairy farm, the further away they are from that, the less they have a strong work ethic, problem-solving skills, and so on. So they want people straight out of 4-H. And th what this raises is issues of how a person is raised, the types of models that they have for the world of work, parents, relatives, friends. And so this raises the issue that, you know, in cultural anthropology, this is kind of a common sense conclusion that skills are culturally um, passed down from generation to generation. And when it comes to something especially like work ethic, we really have to think in these terms. So this is our, one of our main conclusions, is skills aren't just skills, and they're definitely not the same as occupations. What you see, though, in a lot of policy reports, and I know there's some in Oregon, because I've seen a couple of them, when they talk about skills or skill clusters, this is a report from Wisconsin, they talk about nursing or mechanical engineering. Those aren't skills, those are fields. And they rarely drill down to specific competencies that you need to be a good nurse or a good mechanical engineer. So the level of conversation at the policy level is staying really high, and it's not drilling down deeply enough into the specific competencies that we want students to acquire. So the second lesson has to do with, well, OK, if these are important, how do we cultivate them? And this is a short video from an instructor at that technical college in Superior, Wisconsin. And I especially want to direct your attention to how he organized his classroom, and then what he says at the end of this video about where he's thinking his students may go in the future. Tim Wright, Composite Technologies Instructor. I started out life several careers ago as a high school teacher, and in late 1997 I started with Northwest Airlines and started my aviation maintenance career. The composite is a material which is composed of two or more materials. It's still very expensive, but so many manufacturers are realizing that that expense is something they're willing to accept for the product at the end of this, which has this amazing high strength, low weight, durability, resistance to fatigue and corrosion. I really like to get to know my students at a very personal level. My promise to them is that I will keep you engaged 100% of the time, composite technology is a very, very 
rapidly developing field, and, and not just for aerospace, be that construction materials, recreational products, sporting goods, transportation industry, wind power. If they chose to go someplace other than aerospace, they'd be very well prepared to do that. So if they decide to go outside of aerospace, Tim is saying they'll be very well prepared to do that. And he makes this argument in part because he spent enough time in the aerospace industry, which is, like manufacturing, very cyclical. And he described in our conversations mass layoffs that would occur in this industry, like clockwork almost, every six to seven years. And so he felt an obligation to train these students for a variety of industries that they could go into. The other thing, um, they got a, a really big grant to build what was effectively a replicate um, airplane hangar next to the technical college. And he organized all of the benches and the workspace to look just like a Northwest Airlines shop floor. And he was basically doing problem-based learning um, in this classroom. And so that was one of the next things we did is for the instructors who we talked to who were talking about 21st century competencies, what were they doing? Um, unfortunately, we didn't do classroom observations, but when they described their approach to teaching, they talked about things like problem-based learning, uh, multi-audience writing, which is asking students to write for scientific or policy or general public audiences. Um, something like classroom management, when work ethic came up, some instructors would talk about holding students to strict deadlines, um, things like that, in order to teach work ethic as much as they felt a college instructor could and should. But I wanted to emphasize PBL because this is an uh, instructional innovation that's being really pushed from kindergarten all the way up through higher education. And there's a whole lot of research evidence showing that it's a very effective teaching approach to improve learning. Um, the amount of research linking active learning uh, methods like this to some of the other 21st century competencies is not as robust. But there is some research um, suggesting that, and it's uh, growing. But one of the issues that we have when we talk about this is in order to become a teacher in most colleges and universities, you don't need to know anything about teaching. In some cases, um, in some systems, there is some certification requirements. But at a place like University of Wisconsin, you don't need any experience in teaching. And as we think about some of these approaches like problem-based learning, it's extremely difficult to pull off well. And you need um, a lot of training in how to do that. One of the other things that has to be thought about is this is from another study I had done, um, classroom observations of faculty in the STEM disciplines in research universities. And by far the most dominant mode of instruction is lecturing with PowerPoint, which is exactly what I'm doing with you right now. Um, and I'm not one of the researchers that says lecturing is you know, a harmful thing and that we need to abolish it, because a well-designed lecture, especially when it's interspersed with active learning um, techniques, can be a really rich learning experience. But this is the cultural norm in most of higher education, um, especially in four-year universities, lecturing with PowerPoint. And so we're talking about a teaching workforce that has a way of doing things and then often doesn't have training in learning theory or instructional design. That's just what we're working with when we're talking about cultivating these competencies. Another issue that came up in our study that we didn't anticipate, and this was primarily from the technical college respondents, is the role of general ed in the liberal arts tradition. So an administrator at a technical college said, many companies will say, your two-year degrees are so bloated. Why do I need somebody that has to take English or history? And she said, they don't understand that's going to make a really good employee, and that sometimes these employers come back and say, you are right. This person's argument was that certain courses, like English or sociology, were particularly well suited to cultivating skills like writing or oral communication or critical thinking. And that's an argument a lot of people are making about the purpose and the role of liberal arts in gen ed. Um, that's one argument to advance. I don't particularly agree with it because I think a well-designed chemistry or biology course can also cultivate critical thinking and communication skills. But another way to think about this is what's the benefit to students of exposing them to different topics and ideas and ways of thinking? Now, one way to think about this is, yes, our students need to know history, maybe especially at this point in our country's history, in order to be good citizens. Another way to think about this, though, is in terms of vocation and jobs. 
a really interesting line of research in nursing education is looking at when students take an art history course, does that improve their diagnostic skills as a nurse? And the answer is yes. And so this is an example of exposure to arts and humanities directly impacting somebody's ability to, to do their job. And their job is not being an art historian. So the third set of data I want to uh, talk about has to do with training and this idea of hiring for cultural fit, which was really fascinating but also really troubling. So when we asked um, employers about training, 41% relied on informal shadowing. Or as one person called it, we asked them to follow Bob around for four weeks, which can be a really good way to train somebody if Bob is really good and interested in mentoring somebody. But if Bob is not, it can be a very ineffective way to train somebody. But one of the bigger ways to think about these findings is just about one in 10 of these companies were investing in formal education for their internal human capital. That's sending um, employees to a course at a local technical college or to a vendor to learn new machinery. And this is something that the Manpower Group, they're an HR firm in Milwaukee, found in a global survey of employers that only one in five were investing in workplace training. And so clearly when we talk about a skills gap, we also have to talk about whether or not the business community is investing adequate resources in the skills and capabilities of their employees. Another aspect, though, of this is when employers are hiring people, in our sample, 74% said that they're screening for cultural fit. So whether or not you fit the corporate culture of my company. How this translates into practice is it means that people who are absolutely perfect on paper won't get a job if they don't fit the corporate culture. So you can go on that career pathway and get that credential in this high demand STEM occupation, which is mostly what's being promulgated and promised. Um, but if you don't fit the culture, you may not get that job. And so when we pushed people on this, well, what do you mean by corporate culture? This is what they're thinking of. The company history or the size of the company. So if you're a small family owned business, you often have a very distinct identity and you want to fit people to whatever the tradition or the ethos is of that company. Employee attributes is where it gets a little troubling because this is where HR especially would talk to us about having a certain type of employee in terms of age or gender or personality and they would try to match applicants to that group. So I had one HR professional talk to us about a group of young male snowmobiling hunters that they were trying to fit somebody to, which means if you were older, female, and not into snowmobiling or hunting, it was very unlikely you were going to get that position. And then managerial style has to do with the hierarchical or a more flat um, structure within the company. But this issue of cultural fit is becoming an increasingly important topic in sociology and counseling psychology largely because of the potential for discrimination on a number of um, indicators. And so this is something that's never talked about in the context of a skills gap. The idea is you get the right credential, you'll get a job, no problem. But the reality of the hiring process uh, makes it far more complicated. So one of the things that we are um, advancing in our book and this research is instead of a human capital approach, a cultural capital approach. And cultural capital refers to the different types of habits and ways of thinking and acting that you get from your um, family and culture and peers here. And then as you go into college, you acquire new forms of cultural capital within your courses. Often they're disciplinary specific. And ideally, they're they cover the 21st century competencies. And then if you're fortunate, you're going to get through the gatekeeping mechanism of um, the hiring process where what the company thinks is valued cultural capital is what you have. And so this is just a different way to think about this college to work transition. Um, instead of just getting a credential and you'll get a job. And basically this is framing this as a cultural transaction, this process of going through college and then hopefully someday entering the workforce. So the last set of data I wanted to talk about has to do with partnerships. Um, and one of the conclusions is that career pathways and things like internships and apprenticeships are great and they're really um, important, but they're not the only way college and the labor market can work together. And so things like internships, career fairs, job shadowing that involve career and acad academic advising on the college level, 
and then often HR and recruiting on the corporate level, it's a really important way for students to learn about the world of work. Oftentimes a student can go through college and not have any real authentic understanding of what an occupation looks like, and this is a great way to address that problem. Another type of partnership we documented in our research was industry cluster or workforce development collaborations, often on a state or regional level. And this is where you would have um, companies talk about how can we grow biotechnology in the state of Wisconsin. The one I'd like to focus on, though, has to do with curriculum and program advising. And this is where you can have employers sit on curriculum advisory boards and really um, provide educators with uh, up-to-date and immediate information about the types of skills that they're looking for. But another one that was a little bit more hands-off, because a lot of um, faculty don't want somebody telling them how to design their syllabus, is this idea of curricular co-construction, where faculty can go out to an employer community and ask, what are problems of practice that you would like to see addressed? And then faculty import that in the form of problem-based learning or undergraduate research into their courses. And this is something that we saw at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse where they had developed this website, which is not just a place you can go to post an internship or get an internship, but here in Course Embedded Projects, they have lists of problems of practice from local employers and policymakers and nonprofit um, community. And faculty would then go to that list and say, ah, I'm gonna use this one this semester and have my students work on this problem. And then at the end of the semester, the students would present their findings to the client, um, and then that person would hear about what they found. So this is just a really interesting and we thought sophisticated way to kind of bridge this gap between um, a university and the local business community. So one of the questions that's raised by all this um, is this, should we be creating pathways to specific jobs and industries and or should we really be preparing students with transferable skills and providing room for them to explore different career options? And I would suggest that we don't ask this question enough that a lot of the conversation about skills gap is focused on the first. That this is, yes, of course, what we need to be doing. But we need to be asking this broader question. One of the reasons is because the answers to those questions really depend on the type of institution we're talking about and the discipline. So you take an institution like University of Oregon or University of Wisconsin in a, a discipline like biology. Students in those programs are going to go to a whole variety of areas, whether it's graduate school, environmental science, or biotech. So in that case, it makes no sense to funnel a student directly into a biotechnology career. On the other hand, if you're in a two-year biotech associates program, because the mission of that institution is vocational, and that program is focused on that one industry, then it makes perfect sense to funnel them into that industry. Another example of um, some variation between disciplines is nursing. So most nursing students in a four-year BSN program are going to be nurses. And if a program doesn't prepare them for that specific occupation so they can pass the NCLEX and the state boards, they likely won't be accredited and will no longer exist as a program. So the broader point I'm trying to make is this idea of the alignment between college and occupations depends on the type of institution and its mission and the discipline that we're talking about. But too often the conversation about the skills gap is treating this institution with the logic of these institutions and disciplines. So one of the things that happened in Superior, and this is a cautionary tale about when a college becomes too closely linked to a specific occupation or industry, is that that um, company, Kestrel, never got off the ground, so to speak, and they didn't build their manufacturing facility. The students recognized that, stopped going into this program, and they had to close the program after about two and a half years. And so, again, this is, I'm not suggesting that colleges shouldn't pay attention to local opportunities in the labor market, but hitching your wagon too closely to one company is a risky proposition. So the so what question, what does this mean for higher education professionals, um, K-12 professionals? As we think about, you know, how do we deal with some of these issues between college and work? And one of the things about the skills gap idea is it's really intuitive um, and it, because it contains a few grains of truth. 
We do have some localized occupational shortages like nursing in rural areas are in short supply. Higher education is changing dramatically with um, online education and a whole bunch of other reforms. And this idea of a career pathways or a guided pathways, I think is a welcome advance so that we start talking to students about careers. But this whole notion of a skills gap is way too simplistic and focuses too much on structural solutions to reflect the complexity of the issues we're talking about. And I'll let this manufacturer um, say it in his own words. What's funny is that when we talk to our development board or NTC and they talk about the skills gap, they're talking about teaching people to weld. The gap we see is people can't hold a job and can't solve a problem. And that implicates so many other cultural and social and intellectual issues beyond just creating a welding program that we have to be thinking about. Some of the other issues that I think needs to be part of the conversation of skills gaps and college to work is job quality and robots. And so when I mentioned earlier, nursing um, was one of the only fast growing occupations that pays above a living wage. These are some of the other top ones. Home health care aides, personal care aides, and fast food workers. These are some of the fastest growing occupations in our country. And these do not pay above a living wage. And so the quality of jobs that are out there for our graduates have to, has to be part of the conversation. The other thing that needs to be talked about is artificial intelligence and robots. And so some of my new research is focusing on the oil and gas industry in Texas. And fortuitously, before we went there, this piece came out in the New York Times where this VP for operations said, we want to transform our workforce to the point where we need to hire fewer people. And he didn't say this because he doesn't like people or employees, but the, auto the automated facilities have advanced to the point where this one guy could monitor up to 10 wells in oil fields, whereas before it took five or six people. And so this is just the nature of a lot of these industries. Productivity is going up, and the need for personnel is going down. And this is just something that I think students need to be aware of um, in terms of what kind of occupations they're aiming for and what types of skills they need to compete with a robot. So what should our central focus be? And our main conclusion is that all students need to acquire transferable 21st century skills in a specific discipline, not in the abstract, and really robust and rigorous career guidance by the time they graduate, whether it's a two or a four year institution. So I'm just gonna quickly show you this slide. This is when I talk to policymakers and legislative staff. I try to explain if we want that, we need to make investments in the system of training. And this involves um, centers for teaching and learning and college campuses so we can train faculty how to teach. Career and academic advising at too many colleges and universities, these are woefully underfunded. We also need to talk about the employers, how much, if at all, are they investing in workplace training? What are the types of partnerships that exist between the two sectors and how can we really support them? And the elephant in the room, adequate funding for public higher education. So in many of our states, it's inadequate. And so we're talking about each of these components, but especially over here, being undermined by a lack of attention to the types of programs that students need to get these 21st century competencies. And so if we ask the question, are we on the right track as a society? The answer is kind of. The focus on the completion agenda and these shortages in nursing and some other fields is important. We have to be thinking about that. But we're not talking about job quality enough. We're not talking about 21st century competencies enough. Teaching and learning is almost always absent from conversations about um, guided pathways and college to work. And in some states, including the one I'm living in now, Wisconsin, we're seeing an active undermining of this system that I just showed you. And one example of that is this funny, not funny quote from a UW faculty. Morale on campus is lower than it's been at any job I've ever worked, including waiting tables at Pizza Hut in high school and detasseling corn when I was 14. This is a faculty member reflecting the views of a lot of teachers in the state of Wisconsin from K-12 to higher ed after $500 million in budget cuts over the last four years to the University of Wisconsin system, 
regular um, kind of denigrating comments made by state lawmakers about teachers being overpaid, underworked, and lazy, and active questioning about the research program of many faculty in the University of Wisconsin system. So we have a really demoralized workforce of the people that are on the front lines of cultivating these skills in students. And that is a problem. Um, especially in the technical college system, there's shortages in teachers in a lot of the programs that a lot of lawmakers are saying we need more skilled workers in these fields. Well, there's not the teachers there to teach these students. And so six things uh, we argue we need to do. The first is reframe the debate. To stop talking about the skills gap is a blame game where it's college and universities are just falling down. That we need to talk about the shared commitment to education, training, and high quality job creation. Um, this is kind of a pie in the sky. Um, hope that we can t frame the problems differently, but it has to be done. Another is investing in teachers and teaching. This doesn't just mean training faculty from the time of orientation and throughout their careers, but paying living wages, especially to the 70% of instructional staff in our nation's colleges and universities that are not on the tenure track, that are living from contact to contract, often with insufficient wages and no benefits. And then embedding problem-based learning across the curriculum, whether it's in a chemistry or a history course, I think would be awesome. And then maintaining curricular breadth, this is my argument for gen ed and the liberal arts, but also students' ability to explore different career options instead of being tracked, um, and as some students told me in a recent focus group, cornered into committing to a specific job from day one of their college career. I think states also need to provide funding, not just for higher education writ large, but specifically to support systemic reforms within their institutions on curriculum and instruction, but especially thinking about how can academic and career advising be more integrated into the entire student experience. And then finally, engaging employers in collaborative work, but not just um, to serve employers' interests, because that's often how the debate's framed. But what are the students' best interests? Not just upon graduation, but in the long term. Are we really thinking about the students' best interests? And I think in many cases, that consideration is entirely absent. And then finally, there's a whole lot of reforms going on in the sector of higher education. I think we all know that. And many of them are being embraced and pushed with very little evidence, and in some cases, very little thought. I want to single out this one. Uh, do employers really see online badges and certificates as signaling competence? Because some people are making the argument that we no longer need an associate's or bachelor's degrees because employers are hiring on the basis of competency-based badges. And there simply is not enough empirical research to really support that claim. And yet we see a lot of institutions chasing online badges because they tend to generate lots of revenue as a solution to the skills gap. So some next steps in our research program, we're kind of taking this general framework and looking at these issues in four different cities in the United States. Um, I've also started a, a pilot study looking at a, a Eastern Chinese city, and because I'm fascinated by some of the um, cultural and political issues that are um, shaping these college to work dynamics. Uh, we have a new research center at UW-Madison that's looking at all these issues, but especially students' experiences with them. So students' experiences with internships and the job search process, because we think the student voice and experience, um, which includes my research that I just talked about, where there's no student voice, um, is a problem. They need to be, their voices need to be incorporated a little bit more. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to get in touch, and thank you very much for your time. That is a great question that I have no simple answer to. 
Um, maybe you've looked into some of this, Brian, but I know this, when we talk about the 21st century competencies, after the NRC held the workshop to come up with that framework, their next workshop was on assessment. How do we assess critical thinking, communication, problem solving? Um, and there's a lot of work on that. It's highly contentious, especially critical thinking. Like, how do we measure it? Um, but in terms of measuring whether or not it's transferring from discipline to discipline or an academic setting to the workplace, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, it seems like if, if, as you suggest, we should sort of beat down, if you will, the, the idea that it's, it's a skills gap, because skills are sort of poorly defined or maybe too rigidly and specifically defined. And you speak to the role of higher institutions, higher education. And yes, we say, you know, the arts institutions develop with disability and students. Um, although I think, you know, anecdotally, what I've heard from industry people who hire the our products, if you will, that they aren't very uh, adept at transferring skills into, you know, other settings and things. It mm -hmm. seems like that would make a stronger argument for sort of rejiggering the the value system, shall we say. Mm -hmm. you know, so now that I think about this issue a little bit more, I know in my trainings on the learning sciences, a lot of the research that supported contextualized learning, so students learning based on authentic problems instead of abstracted facts or principles, they would study whether or not that would translate to other disciplines or like real world problems. I don't think they would actually take that a step further and study if somebody in a job setting or a workplace setting was able to transfer that. Um, but yeah, now the issue of liberal arts, that's, that's a tricky one. Um, and I think the argument, again, that you could only learn some of these skills in certain disciplines, uh, it, it needs some work. I don't find it particularly compelling. Um, and I think some of the, the, the research I showed about nursing education, um, That'll be interesting to see where that develops, because it's. But again, it's occupation specific, and looking at, you know, how specific observational skills learned in one field can transfer to another. Is that like a generic art history course that the, that the nursing students are going through, or was it specifically focused on, you know, developing certain types of observational skills? I believe that one was, um, it, it was tailored to observational skills. So it wasn't just like going to the art department and taking an art history course. Yes? Um, comments, um, as, as an instructional designer and a, and a graduate of a liberal arts, really good liberal arts program, um, are you, I mean, there's, there's lots of differences between what manufacturing uh, employers want and what knowledge worker employers mm -hmm. want. Are you are you looking at that too? And you know, the second part of that is you know how do you prepare students for jobs that don't exist yet? Um, and you know, I'm talking about transferable skills, but are they going to be the same skills? Are they going to, you know um, have you have you put that into your research yet or? So in our next study, we're looking at um, healthcare, so nursing in particular, computer science, so that's mostly um, higher level programmers, um, advanced manufacturing, and then oil and gas, and that's mostly um, petroleum engineers. Because we recognize some of these skills need to be thought about in terms of a specific discipline and job even. Um, one of the things that one of my colleagues in Rochester is working on is, OK, that's great what people say they want, but what are people actually doing on the job? And so they're studying photonics companies, like what are the actual graduates of these physics departments, mostly, doing in the workplace? Um, and I haven't yet seen some of the results of their study, but that's one of the next things we need to be thinking about. And what's the relationship then to what that discipline is thinking is important? ran interns in, in career development, um, training development in an IT company, um, was to get them to do task analysis. Mm. And, and, and that was a big light bulb for them. Mm -hmm. In terms of the jobs that don't yet exist, um, I think one of the best respondents we had in the study was a German-born 
um, robotics instructor in a, in a technical college who found that teaching his students um, troubleshooting techniques, which he described as a habit of mind or a habit of thinking, was something that would be beneficial to his students in the long term, not just because everything is becoming automated and robot repair people are going to be in high demand, but from his view is this way of thinking through a problem should be, and again this is where there's not going to be evidence supporting his contention, but should be applicable or transferable to a whole lot of jobs because what he was saying is this way of sorting out different, often conflicting sets of information about a broken robot arm or you know whatever, and then selecting the optimal solution, often in communication with the project team, is something that you're going to need to do in a lot of um, occupational settings. Yeah. I'm curious about the, you brought up the example of uh, UW Lacrosse that has the problems of practice. Where do they find those problems of practice? Who finds them? And, and how are faculty being coached to use them in their courses? Do you know much more about that? So this is one of those cases where you get one remarkable person, a faculty member in biology there, who took it upon himself to lead all of this. And luckily I think there's a few more people helping him. But this faculty member would go out to the nonprofit community, employers, local politicians, and he and his students would ask them, so what do you think needs to be really studied in healthcare? As a policymaker, what are some laws or issues that you think really needs to be studied? I think the, the opioid epidemic is a real problem in parts of Wisconsin, so that was on the, the table. So they're all biology examples in this case? No, they were across the board, and I think some people in arts and humanities, some of the faculty, who then this biologist would then coach faculty about how to take these problems and integrate them into their courses. People from across campus were then doing that. Unfortunately, this is one of those programs where all these budget cuts took a pretty big hit to. And so it's just one of those um, cases where these across the board indiscriminate budget cuts are hurting a lot of the functions and services that are directly helping students get these competencies. But, yeah. But it's, it seems to me that corporations, at least it looks like from the trends from ATD and, and DOL, that. Um, you know, corporations are looking more and more for the purple squirrel. You know that that person who has the experience already mm -hmm. um, that doesn't exist, and they're less like they're less willing to train people. And that trend it seems to be narrowing. I mean, they, they used to hire lots of folks that you know, that oh we'll train you, but they want to hire somebody who already has the skills now. Is that something that you see as getting worse? Um, over time or, or you don't see that trend at all? Or? So one of the issues with that question is I think the last survey of workplace training in our country was done in the 90s. There's very little research on the topic. In our current study we're trying to get a sense of the types and um, emphases of workplace training that employers are offering. But right now there's just not much data on it. From the Chamber of Commerce representative that you know told that YOTF story, he said in the last 20 years, a lot of manufacturers in Wisconsin and the Chicago area have figured that problem out. And the ones that aren't out of business often are the ones that have recognized they need to be proactive in either reaching out to high schools and developing internship programs and engaging educational institutions, or the ones that have really developed internal training programs. So, some of the big companies that we visited, they had really sophisticated training programs. It's just they were in the minority. So, but there are some companies that are figuring this out. One of the questions, though, is who's paying for it? Because I know large companies like AT&T, they're, because they're, everything's switching over to fiber optics, they need to tra transform most of their workforce into understanding how to work with that technology. And they've developed some courses, but employees have to take them on their own time and they have to pay for them. And so this issue of student debt for the adult worker becomes an issue. And that's where the for-profit vocational education sector comes into play too. Because there's a whole lot of companies out there offering a lot of uh, vocational credentials. But a lot of them, students are taking on a lot of debt and the completion rate for some of those institutions is pretty poor. Yeah. 
So that's where all this stuff gets really complicated really quickly. Maybe you can speak to that at this institution, Ryan. Um, I know in Wisconsin, uh, so in, in a biology course, one of the ones that we studied, you know, it's that's where the the lab section becomes. It plays a really important role, where oftentimes the labs are designed around specific problems. Sometimes, and actually, this is the same instructor at Lacrosse. They would go to the biotechnology companies and try to get a real problem, you know, like fixing, um, well, I won't even, my, my biology background is very slim, so I won't even try to um, repeat what he was doing, but they were taking a problem from a biotech company and the students had to work on an example of that throughout the course of the semester in the lab. And so that's one example, and then maybe you can speak to other examples, how it's being used here. I don't know how closely it's tied to the industry, but we have a chemistry program where it's uh, focused is substituting some of the, you know, the typical more toxic materials that they use. Do what you can do. I mean, you can do titrations and you can do stoichiometry with Kool-Aid, you know, <laughs> and not with, uh, with chemicals that have to be, they can't be poured down the drain. Uh, but there's a whole focus, the whole there's a whole course where they're doing green chemistry. Maybe Phil, you know more about what's going on. I don't know much about that course in yeah. particular, but um, they do something where they they work with businesses. Julie Hack from yeah. the chemistry department is right. doing something with chemists working with people from uh, the business school who have entrepreneurial ideas related to science. I think it's graduate level. Yeah. So that's a great job. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe it is. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I, yeah, I was. I don't know how to take it further to what's where. Where's the inspired problem that's you know mirroring what's going on in the industry? I'm not. It's not clear to me. Well, in some of these applications, I know in universities, the problem doesn't necessarily have to come from the workplace. The idea is just to have an authentic problem that small groups of students are working on, ideally with you know less and less involvement from the expert or the teacher. But that's where class size becomes an issue, and materials, and how many TAs you have available, things like that. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm just curious. I guess to drill down a little bit, I've been taught labs for 20 years, by the way. Um, you know, labs are viewed by places like this as exotic bees. You try to put a lab brick in them through the UO, and you need nothing to agree for it. Uh, they don't understand the law. Labs are viewed by individual faculty as let's uh, figure out what the guy figured out in 1910 about mm. you know, the Bohr atom or whatever, you know, which are confirmation labs, again, not problem solving. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious as to what enlightened places have figured out policies that actually reward people for doing that effort of making open ended labs that are focused on problem solving and taking the initiative to go out and actually talk to people. Frankly, I don't know that you've ever even seen doing that here. Mm. You know, and that's, I apologize for writing. <laughs> you know, so I'm just curious to say, if you've heard of some other places that have been able to sort of reward and set policies and administrative actions that actually did encourage this sort of thing in labs or mm. in general. Well, so from our study, I could only speak to two examples where we saw labs designed and run that way, and one was an honors program at UW-Madison. Maybe that's the context of an honors program, they can do whatever they want. And the other is these smaller state schools where it seemed like the oversight from the administrative level was very thin. And so this instructor I'm talking about seemed to have kind of free reign to organize his lab the way he wanted to. But I know there's a lot of research on transforming cookie cutter labs to more interactive. Um, I'm not sure how successfully they've been implemented, though. That's a good, that's a good way to I'm, I'm thinking of the tech, 
And we talked about this at Caltech and JPL partnership. They did a lot of problem solving. We have a project based yeah. on physics that we try to get our students to do at the end of the second year in the program, where frankly there's no lab manual, there's no instruction, you go into a room, there's an optics table, yeah. um, you can see you get some kind of trap going. Um, you know, the last group got it this far, you're going to have to learn as you go and figure out how to go from there. So I mean, that's a great example of that. We mm had -hmm. a particular invite to the head chair mm -hmm. <laughs> and all that happened. <laughs> Right. So I think it is possible, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. You have a question? Well, I was um, um, Madison, uh, um, around K-12 K problem-based learning. So first of all, thank you that you bring this up because this has been, I find, a big issue overall because I was a high school teacher, but we were constantly hammered. We need to do more problem-based learning, problem-based learning, collaborative learning. But what happens in high school college then? Right. So we get people pointed, you know, really big enough, and then we send kids off to the high to the university. So, but this has this is for me an issue of K through 20, mm -hmm. not K through 12, mm -hmm. or however far you want to go. Right. Like thinking skills, collaboration skills, all of these topics. The sooner you start, the better. So where are you with this in the K through 12 system? Um, not very far, I have to admit, in terms of a research program. Um, in a lot of ways, we've already carved off too much to study. And so, but that's one of the big weaknesses, is what are people studying and learning and being asked to do from kindergarten through high school? One of the things I'm seeing in Dane County, which is the county that Madison is in, there was a lot of effort to do problem-based learning and active learning, especially in the science curriculum. And that's still going on to a certain degree, but it's been kind of overtaken by this idea of career pathways and personalized pathways. And so I think part of the problems with education is these different trends that come every four to seven years and people jump on them and push these reforms. And often that means that the last reform gets a little forgotten. And this idea of career pathways in high schools now is to create occupation-specific, um, it's like that guided pathway I showed you, but at the high school level, with no whisper of instruction or problem-based learning, which to me makes very little sense. We, gotta, we should be talking about both if we think this career pathway model is a good thing to do in the high school level anyways. So I'm sorry that doesn't really answer your question, but I'm, I'm seeing less emphasis on active learning and problem-based learning in our local high schools and much more on this career issue. So I had another question. So you showed this picture with the, I'm familiar with this transferable skill sets in the modern manufacturing plan where, as you mentioned earlier, it's like they're working on some problem right now for four to six weeks. Something new comes in, might be all the time frame, whatever the project is. So. They constantly have to transfer and burn new skills while they're on the job. Mm. So I've, I've, heard, I've used my <laughs> my thread of thoughts right now because there was something you mentioned earlier. I felt like it is actually soft within the company, within the manufacturer, because they always have to look ahead what's coming up next, even if they don't know. Mm -hmm. They don't know what's coming up next year. Mm -hmm. But this constant change in in skill sets and what you need, but one, some skill sets, I think they, they stay pretty static. Mm. This is like the troubleshooting, mm -hmm. critical thinking, problem solving, all of those skill sets, they're not getting lost. Mm -hmm. You have to have the perseverance mm. that you stick with something that you just don't give up. Right. And I think for that regard, it's not necessarily, I was wondering, is it really necessary in this day and age to obtain a four-year college degree? For a lot of jobs now, um, and for some of the jobs that don't require uh, more advanced specialized knowledge, and in some of these companies that's the engineering level, like a quality engineer, electrical engineer, many of these companies would say the type of stuff we do, if you have basic mechanical aptitude, can read a blueprint and have a decent work ethic, we can teach you how to use our machines, and we can teach you how to do the processes that often are changing every four to six months. So in a lot of cases, no, and that's the argument behind these middle skill jobs, that there's lots of jobs out there that don't require a four-year degree, but they require something after high school. 
Um, one of the issues with the middle skilled jobs, though, is labor economists, when they actually look at the data, there's a lot of disagreement about whether or not they're blooming, and there's lots of them, or whether or not there's what some people call a hollowing out of the labor market. We have a growth on the high end and then the low end part of the labor market. A lot of it depends on how you measure these middle skill or middle wage jobs. Um, and it's something I'm trying to figure out. I'm not a labor economist, but you read different studies and you see very different conclusions. But there are a lot of occupations in the fields that we studied, especially manufacturing, where you definitely do not need a four-year degree. It seems like that would be an interesting thing to look at, was sort of the same kind of job. Somebody that went through four-year and landed in that job, somebody that went through two-year, very focused, very no fluff here. We're going to get down to brass tacks on how to do this job, and then they get out and do the job. It, it evolves as they all do. They're a good job. How do people, you know, looking at how the two different groups move mm -hmm. forward in mm -hmm. that scenario, because that might address this issue of transferability and mm -hmm. lifelong learners. Um, I know that when I was at Cisco, we did a study on that, and the students that came out of technical schools tended to stay in the role longer than the students that came out of okay. regular schools. Okay. And they the ones evolved and went on this sort of different well, jobs or something like or that. Or they or they developed a you know like I don't I'm not getting ahead quickly enough so I wanna I wanna go somewhere else. They they tended to, to go right. out okay. instead of staying. Right. Okay. Yeah. But so and that was the engineers for the most part. IT engineers. Yeah. It was it was an interesting study. It's in Switzerland Germany they have in these programs and I have I'm they, they have a lot of middle skilled yeah. labor jobs and their economies are thriving. Mm -hmm. They don't rely necessarily on all people. And they are living wage jobs. We're not talking mm -hmm. about jobs you're making. You have, they also they have, have a very strong program. apprenticeship program. Too. Exactly. Yeah. And it's just, and students actually in Switzerland, they opt out going to college out of this. They say, why should I? Mm -hmm. But they have a strong economy behind it because they're getting, through their training programs, they're getting a minimum at the beginning. And of, it's not really a living wage, but a minimum income mm -hmm. that it increases as you go through the pipeline of every year. Like the apprenticeship program is similar to mm -hmm. But their economies are thriving, and it's. And <laughs> you have really skilled laborers. And I have seen uh, something on it where there's actually the interview with the students, and they said, So how come? He said, Last on the job in manufacturing plant, and they, the students said, my job looks different this year than it was last year, and they're constantly updating the skill set of the mm -hmm. people working on the manufacturing floor. Mm -hmm. It's the constant learning. He said, yeah, I can't, I can't still, I have to keep learning. Right, right. Mm -hmm. They don't have four or five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I think it's pretty clear that there are a lot of occupations out there that do pay a decent wage where you don't need a bachelor's degree. Um, there's also something going on called upskilling, where there's lots of occupations out there where they used to not require a bachelor's degree, and now they do. And so that's, you know, the credential inflation has been something that people have been documenting for a while. Um, so there's that that's happening. But one of the things that, um, th you know, this German instructor I mentioned, because in Wisconsin, people keep on talking about Germany, Germany, their system's so much better. And he said, until and unless we can get employers to really buy in to some sort of training system within our state or region, offer reasonable wages for interns and apprenticeships, because most companies in Wisconsin want unpaid interns. There's actually been a lot of legal battles about whether internships should be paid or unpaid. And, and with the number of um, students with massive amounts of debt, that they're accruing after they go to college. Um, I, I think it's unconscionable that we're even thinking of asking students to do unpaid internships. But his position was until unless we can get employers to buy in, have like a, a reasonable wage set, that we're never gonna be able to even replicate parts of that system. And then monitoring the quality of the internship and then you know people's uh, flowing into the labor market's another issue. So. I'm curious yeah. how how are the conversations, I mean, how do you get an audience in terms of policy, policy makers and administrators and, and what are the points that are resonating? You know, 
when you mm. I share a presentation, I imagine something similar to some of the points you shared here. What points stick? And how are you having are you getting any traction for reframing the conversation around that, that first point you had? Do you reframe the conversation? Uh, no. The, when I talk to administrators, especially deans and people that are interacting with chancellors and the legislature, the pressure to recalibrate colleges and universities to deal with the career problem is at the top of everybody's list. And so career advising and academic advising are things that are being actively talked about at many institutions now. Um, how can we restructure them? How could we improve the student experience so that they learn about more careers and jobs by the time they graduate? That's what resonates the most. Um, the curriculum and instruction piece often does not resonate. And when I talk to legislative staff, a lot of this stuff doesn't resonate because there's, in some states, and Wisconsin unfortunately is one of them, um, the views of the higher education sector are so negative that the thought of investing more public dollars into it, it's, it's, they're not there yet. They're still on the war path about these institutions. And Wisconsin, just yesterday, is, um, they're going to be voting on a new free speech amendment because these liberal institutions aren't allowing the flowering of conservative thought. I mean, that's the priority right now of a lot of legislators. And so I'm not finding a whole lot of traction with some of these issues, even though this is concerned with one of the issues that everybody's talking about, workforce development and the economy. So sorry to be Debbie Downer on that, but yeah. Well, thank you all for your time. I really appreciate it. And if you have any other questions or comments, feel free to send me an email. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Yeah.